get out. Maybe you want to bring your boy toy over for some afternoon delight. I'm happy to distract young Liam there from the double boy grunts. Get out! Calm down. I have a few repairs to right. do on the house. Now that Fiona okay. has dropped the ball, someone's got to pick it up, and that someone is me. Wait, plus, my my clothes are in the wash. Yeah, to the count of three, dressed or not, Frank, one. Let's take a vote. Everyone in favor of having an actual parent in the house. Huh? Two. Oh, two gone, shit. You never say three. Frank! What the hell did you do with our washing machine? You mean my washing machine that you stole from me when you kicked me out of the house that I secured for all of us? The house... <laughs> William H. Macy, one more time. Thank you all. Sure, thanks so much for being here. Seven seasons of Shameless. That's incredible. What are the odds, eh? Were you expecting that when you signed on to this show? When you did the first season, were your thoughts, this is gonna last a long time? Because it's a, it's a different kind of show. It's a long shot. My wife had done a show that went seven seasons, but boy, it's, uh, it's winning the lottery. It's, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't happen every day, I'm thankful. And you guys work, you guys work your asses off on this show. I've seen, I, you've, I've seen interviews where you say, you think you guys shoot more pages in a day than, than any other show out there? I keep saying that. I don't think it's true, but I'm going to keep saying it because it feels that way. A TV minute is 42 minutes. A, a TV hour is 42 minutes, right? Something like that. And um, ours is 60. Our hour is 63 minutes. Uh, our, page, our scripts come in at about 65 pages, and we shoot them. Wait, don't tell me. In... Um, Seven days, I believe, including uh, the pickups in Chicago. So six days, something like that. That's fast. That's 10 pages a day. 10 pages a day is crazy, especially a show of this kind of quality. This isn't like a, a sort of fake reality show or anything like that, where no. you can sort of set, set things up and zoom in and out and sort of find the action as it happens. This is all blocked out and, and, and planned. That's very difficult to do. Are these hard days? They're rough days when you've got... Um, when it's you all day, yeah, that's, that's a big day. It's thrilling, it's a great way to make a living. It's, it's really fun. One of the things, are you actors? A lot, most of you are actors? I think some of them are actors. Hands and directors. You are an actor and director back there, good for you. Any pharmacist? <laughs> Just checking. Uh, don't tell me, what was I saying? Um, uh, I think we were oh, still- Oh, if you're an actor, you'd love this. The way we do Shameless is uh, we do the entire scene almost every single time. It's handheld, and our camera guys are uh, acrobats, nothing short of that. So we'll shoot the whole scene. So it could start here on the stage, go into the audience, back into the dressing room, back into the audience, and back on stage, sometimes up a flight of stairs, and we'll do the whole thing without a break. So as an actor, you get to do two and a half pages uh, of a piece, and it's... It, it's like real acting, right. as opposed to doing um, little tiny pieces of it as one does in a big feature. So it's a thrilling way to, to do things. And you've directed an episode uh, of Shameless, right? I did. Just one? Just one. It's really hard. You think it's hard to act in these things. Oh, that's, I've direct, we were talking about it. I, I started directing films. I've done three films and one Shameless. And, um, Shameless was the, the harder of, the, of, the, of those four projects? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, it's the aforementioned 10 pages in one day, plus I was in the thing. It's not, it's, I hate that. That part sucks, hippo How? dick, as far as I can tell. When you have to be, <laughs> when you have to put down the thing and go start acting, you have to give up this thing that means so much to you and let somebody else shoot it. How are you on directing yourself? I didn't do too well in the episode I did. Uh, <laughs> I forgot to do coverage of myself. Apparently, that's a very common thing. I got to edit the thing, and I thought, where the fuck am I? Can I say fuck? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Where the fuck am I? I forgot to shoot me, and I wanted to shoot the camera guys. You, you, they're supposed to get my back. 
That's an extremely common thing, though, because, yep. I mean, most actors, especially when they get behind the camera, don't ever want to come across as vain. So there's almost like this instinctive urge to not sort of say, let's do more of me, because you don't want anyone to perceive you as, like, focusing heavily on yourself. Perhaps. More to the point, it's you're driving the bus, and you have to sort of get out of the seat and let somebody slip back in without slowing down the bus. And then they drive and you go back in the back and you'll, all you want to do is get back to the driver's seat. Wow. That's, I, it's not vanity, I, I, at least it wasn't for me. Also, I acted badly because I don't know how people do it. I don't like it. Um, now, after seven seasons of doing the show, we've seen Frank get sober at points. We've seen, that in this season, Frank is uh, running a homeless shelter. We just saw the, the people that were from his shelter in that scene. And, uh, you know, the, he's, he's had some ups and downs. Do you, after a certain point in working the show, work with the writers to develop places that you want Frank to go at all? Or do you just kind of let it all come to you and sort of sink your teeth into it? I let it all come to me. Um... In years past, John Wells would get together with each of us and tell us in the broadest strokes where this season was going to go, what your character was going to do. This past season, I was shooting this movie, and I never got to have that, that lunch with John, and I decided to do it not knowing where the, where the year was going to go. So I was discovering it script to script. Part of that was good, I think. I think... Um, <laughs> Uh, but interestingly, at the beginning of the season, I th thought I was scamming people about family, and it turns out it was real. Um, anyway, it was interesting to, to do it that way. No, uh, the writers have started to sort of listen to our voices. We hang out with them a little bit. They wisely keep the writers and the actors apart. And, um, but they've gotten to know us. And now they're writing to our personalities and our foibles and our speech patterns. Was there ever a moment where you got a script and you looked at it and, you, and thought to yourself, oh, they, they're getting my speech patterns and they're getting a, sort of like what I do really well. I can, I can see it on the page now. Yes, Frank has a, a voice which is distinctive. And um, I think it's most noticeable in the, in the absence. You know, every once in a while we'll get a script where they kind of blew it, the voice isn't correct somehow. And um, interestingly, it makes it narrow on to impossible to memorize when the voice gets wrong. It's weird. Uh, Emmy Rossum also directed an episode this she season, did. right? Yes, and she did a good job. I haven't seen it, but she did a good job. What was that like working with her as a director? It was... I, if she does it again, it'll be more comfortable. Uh, I guess I was very aware of supporting her. Uh, and um, I don't know what that means, how you support the director. So mostly I was just uncomfortable around her. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do, trying to help her out. But boy, she had uh, great authority and uh, moved things along at a breakneck speed. Perhaps I thought, she should have slowed down and gotten a little more coverage. Boy, those, that's something as a director you, you regret when you moved on and you could have gotten more takes. You sit in the edit room and you just want to blow your brains out. That's the kind of the hardest thing as well because if you go into shooting a scene with an idea as to what it's going to look like while editing it, editing it that's a, like the first thing that you realize. You're most likely wrong about it and you should just shoot everything that you can possibly shoot so you can shape the scene however yeah. you can shape it later, right? Yes. Interestingly, I, I sit here from two perspectives, one as an actor and one as a director. As a director, yes, absolutely, you want to shoot until the cows come home. You want to shoot anything that you can possibly think of. You want every option that you can give yourself once you get to the edit room. But as an actor, oh, Lord. <laughs> Let me get out of here. <laughs> oh, yeah. When you know... If you use that shot, you can't use that shot, so why do, you, do I have to do both shots? Uh, you know, I had dinner. Uh, well, you, you know, you look back at your, some, of your, some of your favorite directors, some of, for me, it's some of the guys that you've worked with, you know, the Coen brothers, Paul Thomas Anderson, David Mamet, like these incredible directors, and everything seems exacting and specific when you watch those movies. So the first time you go into making a movie, you imagine that you should be that exacting and specific for what you're shooting. How did, when you made these movies with these guys, did you notice that they were also sort of shooting around and getting lots of coverage as well? 
a bit. Uh, David, uh, Dave Mamet and the Cohen brothers and Paul Anderson are all three of them exquisitely prepared. They do. Their shot lists are serious. They mean something. They do storyboards often. Um, and Dave's famous for saying, shoot the plan, man. Shoot the plan. If you try to get creative when you're on the set, you're lost. <laughs> right. It's all about executing the plan. Yeah, I don't care what the budget is. There ain't enough time. And uh, Dave Mamet says something great. He says, when you're shooting a really exciting chase scene, you better be bored. <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. But uh, those guys are, they craft their movies and um, they design their shots. It's a whole different style to go in sort of guerrilla-esque, shameless style. It sounds like a, a touch football game on our set sometimes. I mean, the, you know, one camera guy will go, I'm bored with shooting him. I'm going to shoot her for a while. Okay, you get her, and I'll duck and go under here and get him as he goes down the stairs. And <laughs> we're just acting our little hearts out, and these guys are running around trying to take pictures of it. It's, it That's works. amazing. So everybody's kind of on their toes and running around and working together. It's not this kind of thing where it's like yep. there's a second AC who's like telling one other person to pull focus and telling someone and then coming to you and telling you that you need to move. Every, you can see everything happening. Yes, and it's a race to get as much in the can as we can. And um, by using two and sometimes three cameras, uh, you do end up with a lot of choices. Interestingly, I think it was the first season, I said to one of the directors, when are you going to get, you know, my hero moment? You know, I had a really funny line. When are you going to get that? And he said, oh, dude, you're done. That was the second shot of the day. You got that a long time ago. And the bad thing about that is I, I don't think I was very good. And the good thing about it is it teaches you to approach these scenes of a piece. And you don't try to make it right. You just try to make it work uh, because it's such a, it has a through line and there's a lot to it. and. Uh, and it's lovely to be spared of that thing where you've got a funny line and then they go, okay, here we go. You ready? <laughs> be funny. All the cameras are on you. You can skip that because the tendency is to want to do it better. And I don't know much, but I know this. You can't do it better. You can only do it. Just keep doing it. You can't do it better. It's kiss of death. You just, kind of, you just do it until the person who is in charge tells you that they've gotten it. Yeah. But you as an actor will never know if you've done it better? That's not what I, in my, in my personal opinion, yes, that's not your job. Um, you can do it differently. You can do it differently. You figure out what you want, and then it's uh, in the best of all worlds. Everybody knows the lines well enough. It's just an improvisation that you and I are doing. And what they're shooting, I try to get my mind off of that, and it's, that's their job. And um, I think it works better. You don't put all that pressure on it. Now, you, uh, you just finished directing your third movie, mm -hmm. right? You've got two of, two of which are, are, are coming out. What was the first lesson you learned when directing your, your first movie? What a great question. Um, well, nothing can prepare you to direct a movie. Anybody here ever do it? It's like getting hit by a city bus and dragged for four blocks. It's really something. You can't be prepared. I remember after the second day of prep, this is just the hard prep. The office, most people hadn't been hired. Second day, I thought, I think I might be too old for this. I'm not going to be able to do this. It would, there were two 12-hour days, and I, I couldn't get myself up the stairs to go to bed. It was awful. I did find my sea legs. What was the question? It was the, I mean, it sounds like you learned a, a number of things, but what the first, what did I learn? the first thing you learned, like the first major learning experience? Well, I've been around the block a bit, so I wasn't blindsided by some of this stuff, but here's an interesting story. At a point, my first film's called Rudderless, and it's uh, Billy Crudup and Anton Yelchin. It's a beautiful film. Thank you. 
Rest in peace, Anton. What a lovely, wonderful actor he was. Um, it, we're on a boat, and Billy and Anton are talking, and they're my stars. And uh, I was having a rough day, and I thought, Bill, you got a good crew here. Sit the fuck down. Pick up your ukulele. It's all going to be OK. You can calm down. You don't have to be wound up for every single shot. Calm down. Well, when I got to the edit room, here's Billy, here's Anton. In the far background is a very attractive woman in a bikini lying on a boat like this, right between them, looking directly at the camera, and she's being languid. You couldn't look at anything but her, and that's the last time I got calm on a set. <laughs> It can go south in a nanosecond. Without pointing fingers, though, aren't there other people who yeah. should make sure that doesn't yeah. happen? Yes, thank you very much. My point exactly. There's a cameraman who's looking through the lens. You didn't see her. Because I remember one time it's in, a, in a project that I was on, I I, com I complained about a problem, and it was like a problem. It was like I just don't think I shot it that well, or the lights weren't the way the lighting wasn't how I wanted it to be or something like that. And it was a very amateur mistake. And someone was like, well, that's, you should blame your DP for that. And I was kind of like, real? I mean, I guess so, but it's also my job to sort of oversee him it to is. a degree. That's, that's the thing about directing. There's, you, you look behind you, there's no one there. It's you. You're climbing lead. And everything. The best way that, I've ever heard it. There's, yeah. You look behind you, there's no one there. No, they're just saying, what are we going to do? because I'd like to get home tonight. What are we going to do next, Bill? And um, everything goes wrong. It's your fault. One of my uh, favorite moments of, of your career is the New Year's Eve scene in, in Boogie Nights, the long take in Boogie Nights, all the way through Jack Horner's home and to the back to where your wife is. Stunning shot, isn't it? It's, it's incredible. Uh, how many times did you guys do that take? What was it like choreographing that and planning it? Because as an actor, you're only going to get a couple times to do a take like that, or a, a shot like that in your career. Big shot. Yeah. It took uh, hours to set up. Paul did a lot of that in Boogie Nights, but it would take, literally it would take four hours to set it up and 30 minutes to shoot it. Because once it was set up, it was easy. That shot, I'm so glad you asked me about that. That's the last time that they let uh, an actor use what's called a gore gun. Uh, it, they changed the rules right after that. Not because of that, but it, I controlled the pistol shot. Do you guys know the shot? I go walking around looking for my wife, and then uh, finally I walk in a room and I find her having sex with another guy. I, I shoot them both. Well, you walk back out to the car. Oh, I walk back out to the yeah. car. Yeah, right. Sorry, it's all one Get, shot. It's incredible. All one shot. Get the gun out of the car. Lock the car. <laughs> did you lock the car? That was my idea. Paul just howled when I did that. Lock the car, went back in, shot them both, go back out, look at the audience, and blow my brains out. And uh, with the exception of a cut inside the room where, no, nope, nope, no. No, what they did was you will go into the room and you don't see you. That's right, you don't going see into the. Well, you, you, go, you see you like through the doorway firing, but you don't see yeah. the bodies, and then you come walking That's back right. out. I think he shot too them. Many times. <laughs> I think they sh Paul shot them getting shot, but he didn't use it. He just did that. At any rate, what they did was I held when I there must have been a cut from the car. There must have been a cut from the car, but at any rate, I had that gun in my hand. I know when the cut was, and you hardly noticed it. After I shot them, when I walked back out, there was a cut there. When I walked back out, I had this pistol in my hand, and tied to the trigger was a, it was electronically hooked up to what they call a gore gun. It was a backpack that I wore, and it had a tube that went right here, and it would blow brains and blood all over the wall behind me. And I operated it by sticking my mouth and pulling the trigger. So there was no timing problem there. And to answer your question, we shot it 
we did two takes. The first take, we got all the way around. I walked out, and bam, the thing went off prematurely. And it took 45 minutes an hour to clean all that crap off the walls. And the second one, it went well. And I gave the, audience, I gave the people in the party there that smile. I loved that. And um, uh, pulled the trigger and just dropped out of frame. And then I looked up, and then there's, everyone is at the monitor watching playback of the thing. And they go like this, and they go, oh, oh. <laughs> play it again, play it again. Oh. And I thought, I think we got this shot. And that was it, one take. What did, what did you think when, uh, when you first saw a screen of that movie, when that movie came out? Because at this, at this moment in time now, I think Boogie Nights is just largely considered a, a classic. Oh, yeah. I loved it. I love everything Paul Anderson does. He's, he's got such a great storytelling way about him and um, indefatigable knowledge of film. He's seen every movie ever made. Um, and he's great fun. Uh, going back to Shameless, um, this season, have you ever had an take an issue with, Frank, with what Frank has done or had to do? Have you ever kind of wanted not wanted to shoot something that uh, an antic that Frank was going to get up to once <laughs> uh, only once and it was just over the line it was in the second season and it was just too grotesque and i thought i'm going to i'm going to lose audience i'm going to lose i can't recover from this that's just too ugly and um, they cut it so they, we didn't have to do it, but I've never asked them to drop anything ever since then, and I've done some weird shit. <laughs> you know, I gotta ask. There's been there's a, a lot of talk in the post postmortem of the election of the quote white working class, low income voters, specifically white the characters on Shameless. Where do you think they would fall on on political lines? Lord, would they? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think Frank would ever make it to the polls. <laughs> He'd have great intentions, but something would mess it up. He'd get arrested, you know. He'd be the one they say, see, voter fraud. Right. Um, I don't know. I, um, Fiona would have voted for Hillary, for sure. Debbie would have. Um, might have split the ticket in that household. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. Who has questions out there? Hello. Uh, Hi. One of my it's favorite. Weird, isn't it? It is. You get used to it, and then you start to like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my favorite things about Shameless is all those rants that Frank just goes on, whether it's you know the teachers at school or how his family treats him when he's at the alibi. Like, how do you prepare for, the, for those rants? Do you, do you just sit by yourself and just, you know, just immerse, immerse yourself into that rant? Yeah, it really comes down to learning the lines. It's unusual in television on a TV schedule to get a page and a half of monologue. It, it's, and they do love having Frank go on. A couple of times I've said to the writers, you know, I have to memorize these. Um, <laughs> Do you have a trick for memorization at this point? Funny you should ask. Felicity taught it to me. Yeah. Uh, you'll just, I can, you'll give up the will to live if I try to explain it. But uh, <laughs> basically, uh, you know, you look at the, I stay on the page a lot longer. Um, yeah, I've got this trick and uh, I'm pretty good at learning lines. Pretty good at learning lines now. A couple of times I've been caught off guard. Uh, we were in Chicago and I decided to look at, on the airplane on the way there. I worked the next morning at 5 a.m. and I thought, let's see what I have to do. I thought, I think they changed it. I thought I had two scenes. I had nine scenes. I had so many pages of dialogue to memorize in 24 hours and I did it. <laughs> I did it. I was dancing around up there. I had it solid. I was proud of myself. I'm 66. And that's like proud of yourself, but then at the same time, you proved to the writers what they could throw at you. So they were kind of like, great, you can do it. We'll you give you more. <laughs> yeah, I do love to talk on. It might have, you might have noticed by now. Uh, next question. Hi, how are you? Good. 
Um, I'm a big fan of yours and Felicity's actually. Um, and my question for you is, when approaching the role of Frank initially, was that something that you kind of fell into a character or did that involve a lot of preparation and also after seven seasons, what's it like now? I'm, um, I'm from this school of thought that um, a lot of preparation is not beneficial. I mean, certainly if you're going to play a surgeon, you want to learn how surgeons scrub and how they handle the instruments. But in terms of preparation for the character, I've always felt everything you need is on the page. If, you, if I needed to know more, the writer would have told me that. Um, and certainly with something like this, I mean, how do you prepare? Drink heavily? <laughs> I did that, but it didn't necessarily help the role. I'm not a big preparer. Um, how do you my, play? My daughter is going into this business, I think. She's at LAXA at, um, in Los Angeles, which is the performing arts high school there. And uh, I had to talk to her about acting. She kept asking me about it. And I thought, and I've taught my whole life. It's the way I kept the wolf away from the door for years. And then one time I started listening to some of the horse shit I was saying, and I stopped teaching. And, um, <laughs> but uh, how to synthesize it for Sophia? And I said, OK, here it is. The hardest part is learning the lines. Can we just say it? It's the worst part, learning the fucking lines. There's no other way to do it except to sit down and do it. And then it's got to look like you're making it up on the spot and you've never say it, said it before and it sounds like a real conversation. The end. That's all I know about acting. It's got to look like you're talking to someone, really talking to someone. Figure out how to do that. I can't think of anything else. And this all the, I don't think you need a lot of emotional prep. I don't think it helps. But this is coming also from a guy, you studied acting. You, you were not just worked as an acting teacher, but didn't you study acting with, with Mamet at the Atlantic Theater Company? I did, I know. I'm sort of going back on myself, but. Well, no, but that's interesting because aren't his teachings, and I, you know, don't quote me on this, I'm not soup, I don't know everything about it, but aren't they, in some ways, his teachings about acting are kind of mechanical. They're not about emotions that much, and they're not about yes. preparation all that much. There's the sort of metronome story of him and, and actors, no? Uh, yes. Oh, that is okay, I warned you. Uh, uh, I'm a sopophoric when it comes to talking about technique, which is to say I'll put you to sleep, but... Um, Dave teaches a form of Stanislavski, which is Sandy Meisner. Uh, when Stanislavski came to this country, he never came to this country. When we brought him here, it came down to, you, many of you know this, it came down to basically Meisner and his technique and um, Lee Strasberg and his technique. And there was a variations on it. But at the end of the day, it was about what's the most important thing, how you're feeling or what you're doing. I fall in the what you're doing category. Um, Dave's point of view was you can't control your feelings. So any technique based on controlling your feelings is kind of on the face of it, fake. I mean, if you could control your feelings, we wouldn't have psychiatry, would we? And um, he says it's more about what you're doing. It's all about the objective. And if you perform the objective, it will engender those feelings, all the feelings you need. And I think that's pretty true. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, thanks for being here. Congrats on the seventh season. I actually went to theater school in Chicago, and I did my thesis paper on practical aesthetics, uh -huh. which is the technique that we we're talking about. Um, you've worked in uh, Chicago, and you've worked in New York in terms of theater. What are some of the biggest differences you think in terms of that industry and this industry? Great question. Um, I was in, I, I moved to Chicago in the 70s, and um, it was called Off Loop. We call it Off Broadway here. In Chicago, it's Off Loop. It's the contract. It was the same contract. And um, I think the theater size was 150. There were a bunch of theaters there, but my friend Stephen Schachter and Dave Mamet and myself started a theater company called the St. Nicholas Theater. And after a time, we rented a warehouse and built a theater. I'm a bit of a carpenter. And, um, oh, we own that town. But what happened was that our first play was American Buffalo, and the second play was a hit 
of Moon Children, and then we did a hit production of a view from the bridge, so three hits right in a row. You had to know me to get a ticket to that place. And um, uh, the whole town sort of exploded and it became a company town and there's still a lot of companies there. And you, to work at a theater, you in essence had to join the theater company and work with them. And uh, it was sort of grassroots, it was, uh, it was, it had Chicago's personality on it. Um, there were a lot of people writing, a uh, lot of crazy stuff getting done. And uh, if, if I may, I would say the work was done for the work because it was what it was. It's not, we didn't, Chicago, did, you didn't go to Broadway, uh, the, the Chicago equivalent of Broadway. Uh, it didn't exist. There was just this off loop. And the other theaters, the big theaters were kind of roadhouses, the Goodman and things like that. So what you see is what you get. So we did it for the work. As a matter of fact, we were quite chauvinistic about New York. Fuck New York, I don't need to go to New York. <laughs> we all said that until we moved to New York. <laughs> New York, on the other hand, you use the word industry. And it is a, it's a business. It's older and um, it's got Broadway, which is, um, let's face facts, that's the... That's it, that's the top of the top. That's as good as it gets. To have a great role in a hit Broadway play is as high as you can rise on the spiritual level in this world, if you ask me. There's no up from there, man, that is. You are the cock of the walk and you feel great. <laughs> what a life, too. You, you go out after the show and you drink till two o'clock in the morning and then you sleep till 11 because you gotta be ready to go. You only work two hours a day. It's a great way to make a living. <laughs> I've never seen anyone undersell doing a Broadway play. You only work two hours a day. Everybody that I've ever talked to is, is, is like, it's so hard. It's the hardest thing ever. I didn't say it wasn't, but you have to sleep till 12. That's, <laughs> it's hard to have a, what do you call it? When you have children and stuff, family. It's hard to have a family <laughs> when you're doing a Broadway play. What was the question? The difference between them. Uh, you know, it, it, there was Broadway. A lot of people did off-Broadway so they could get on Broadway, or they did off-off-Broadway so they could get... We only did plays to do the play, and we all saw each other's plays. There was a sleepy little German bar across the street from the St. Nicholas Theater, and it went from... I mean, there was World War II marching music on the jukebox. I'm not kidding. And uh, in one year, it became the theater bar, and it was right across the street from us. Man, it was packed. It was called the Gaslight. When, if you can get laid in the gaslight, that you had a problem. That was not the gaslight's fault. It was great. Two times in the 70s, the Cubs almost went all the way. They won the, uh, it was just a great time. Are you still a Cubs fan? Yes. How, did, I, how, how was uh, your, I, your I was your in World Chicago. I, I didn't go to the game, but I was in Chicago when they won. That's amazing. It was great. I was right downtown. I went to bed. I had a 5 a.m. call, but it sounded like World War III, man. <laughs> There was a guy outside my window. I looked down there. He was just looking up at the sky and he screamed for two hours, just ha ah, ah. ha. <laughs> I didn't blame him. He could scream, have screamed all night. Uh, I have to let you go. Shameless is on Showtime right now. The seventh season is on. Yep. You can see all of them as well on Showtime.com. Big finish to this season. We thought it might be the end of the whole shebang, so it's got a big finish. Is it not the end of the whole shebang? You guys are doing another season afterwards? Uh, I'm announcing that we're going to do 10 seasons. That's a rumor. Uh, 10 seasons total or 10 more seasons? Two more okay. for 10 total. I'm not, I'm not doing 11. I refuse. I don't know. I hope we do more. I'd, I'd love to do more. We'll find out. William H. Mason, thank you so much thank for being here. Thank you, everybody. Here. Thank you.